Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Lightspeed Lawn Care Marketing Podcast. Chase Grant is the owner of Grow Landscaping. He is a 20-year-old lawn care business owner and lawn care YouTuber, and his mission is to spread advice to help others grow their green industry businesses. So Chase, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. So what I thought would be a good topic when when you approached me about being on the show was to talk about the kind of major mistakes that business owners make on their way to hitting $100,000 in top line revenue and kind of like the the ways to resolve those mistakes to get past that hurdle. And I thought it would be really good to have you on as a young, scrappy entrepreneur who has been through a lot of those hurdles, but recently, right? Because you talk to a lot of guys who are, you know, well past a million dollars in top line revenue. And it's like, well, they remember the hurdles they jumped 20 years ago. And, and they're, you know, different than the hurdles that, you know, younger guys like you and I face. So mm-hmm. I I thought we'd just kind of dive in and talk about it. But yeah, what I, I recently I talked to John Pajak on a recent podcast episode, and we talked about guys kind of getting stuck in that 40 to 80K range, where yeah. it's like a healthy salary, but it's hard to scale the business on. So I think that's kind of who we're mainly talking to is those guys stuck in there to give you kind of a frame of reference. But yeah, let's just let's just jump in. What what do you think is like one of the big mistakes that you see people making? Well, I I would say probably the biggest mistake I see a lot of people making is when they're smaller, thinking that they need to add more services to grow their income, because I feel like when you're smaller and you're only making, say, 40 to 80K per year, people get a limiting belief that they have to add more services or they need to start doing extra jobs just so they can start to increase their salary. When if they really do run the numbers, they can make a lot more than 40 to 80K in their service area. And when you you know see the amount of clients and the client base that's in your actual area and run the numbers of how many people do live in your area, it kind of opens your mind a little bit and makes you realize that, you know what, I could probably do this through literally just trimming hedges. If, if I really wanted to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think what, what a lot of guys get stuck on, and I was absolutely there in 2020, where it was anything even sort of marketing related, any vertical, we would take any client, just like any, any work that we could get. Yeah. We'll design your postcard, all of this sort of stuff that was kind of outside of our, what we had said was our core. And it, you know, if you want to deliver a quality job and you're having to learn a whole new skill set for each job, you're spending a lot of time and you're going to end up making like less than minimum wage trying to do an excellent job doing 20 different jobs instead of just focusing in on, you know, like two or three core services that you can be the best at. Yeah, 100%. And I I, I agree with that 100%. I always, you know, in, in my time coming up in this short period that I have, you know, blown up pretty recently, I kind of figured out that when you do niche down and make, say, for example, a Monday specific to mowing, and you don't like transfer from mowing to landscaping, and the least amount of, I would say, complete switches up, switch ups you mm. do in the middle of the day, yeah, you, it'll, it, it kind of makes you realize it's weird how much productivity you save through just not having to switch, you know, switch equipment, or just switch the type of jobs that you're doing. If you're doing strictly mowing, I 100% agree with just doing strictly mowing, at least in that specific day. Mm-hmm. Because when you do make those, you know, 180s, it, it's surprising how unproductive it starts to become throughout the Yeah, it, every day. time you do that switch, it kind of robs you of your momentum. It's like if you're running yeah. and every 10 feet, you have to completely switch directions. It You're never going to get going very fast because you're constantly shifting your momentum. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I think kind of fits under this, we're kind of calling this like the wrong business plan section of this, these mistakes. So we've got like too many services saying yes to everything, saying yes to bad money is then like not having a target client. You know, you're kind of trying to be everything to all people kind of like, you know, you, you don't have an idea of who you're marketing to, who your ideal client is. And so you end up working all sorts of places and, People aren't going to know that, you know, well, we cut Miss Betty a deal because she's a little old lady. And and so we, you know, we kind of cut corners on her lawn because we're doing her a favor to do it. 
they don't know that. All they see is your guys out there doing, you know, substandard install or whatever it is. And that's connected to your brand now in their mind. So you really have to like hone in on who your ideal client is so that you're focused on on delivering quality service specifically at that price point. Yeah, I I 100% agree with that. And I agree with, you know, when it comes to niching down to a certain client archetype, I agree with thinking in the mind of, you know, a bigger business owner when it does, even when you're a smaller guy, I I, th- I think it's smart to kind of think like, okay, if I was scaling a million dollar company, would I be sitting here cutting every single person deals, you know, behind, behind other customers back, but just making it super systemized. Okay. Client mm-hmm. comes in, this is the price they get. There's no kind of wiggle room. It's just, okay. It's just the same price. I, I kind of noticed with the bigger a company gets, the less they wiggle on price. So say, for example, you look at something like a smaller business, a smaller agency, maybe, and they maybe will give you a deal if you do this for them, or you can do bartering system. But then if you go to like somewhere like McDonald's, I mean, the price of a Big Mac is the price mm-hmm. of a Big Mac. You know what yeah. I mean? You, yeah, exactly. There's no wiggle room. There's no bargaining. And I think it's smart to kind of position yourself in that way where you just, okay, this is the price and this is, I'm just going to, you know, go through like this and try to hammer away because it does save you a lot of time not having to sit and, you know, keep discussing and wiggling with your price and adjusting everything for everyone. It just, it creates a lot of, you know, disorganization. Yeah. If you're not doing like super boutique projects where you have like, you know, almost unlimited time to dedicate to a client because they're spending, you know, six figures on their backyard remodel or whatever, then it really becomes like when I have 500 clients, is this amount of negotiation going to feel worth it? Am I even going to have time to have this level of negotiation with every lead that comes through the door? Or do I need to have, you know, like you said, a system in place that is either, you know, the price of a Big Mac is the price of a Big Mac. You know, we really... We have to, we've built our business in a way that serves this pricing structure. And if we deviate from that, it's going to hurt the business. Yep. A hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. So kind of the fix here is to identify that ideal client, you know, exactly the kind of job that you want to be doing your exact core services and cut back to only the services that you're the best at and are, and like they're at the intersection of your quality that you want to deliver and your expertise and profitability. And so find the ones that kind of are at the happy medium between all of those, keep just those core services, sell them in the neighborhoods that you want to be working in. We have actually on our YouTube channel, a video about kind of structuring your business plan that we'll have a link to in the description that might help you out as you're trying to figure out what those core businesses or core services in the business should be. But I think we're, we're probably ready to jump to the, the next thing. And I'm sure you have thoughts here. The, the other big mistake that I hear people making is they compete on price. They don't price their services high enough because they're so worried about what the competition charges. Have you, have you like, I feel confident that you've like felt this tension. Yeah, because, you you know, when you first start, it is, it's, you know, kind of enticing to drop your price to get any job that comes. Mm -hmm. And in some scenarios, I do agree with getting a bunch of work right, right out the gate, just so you have work to do and you have income to work with to, Mm -hmm. you know, do marketing. So I, I do agree with, you know, maybe that, having a lower price in the very beginning, but I mean the absolute beginning. Mm -hmm. Once you start building a client base, I think what you need to do is look at it in a fact like this. So say I want one route and maintenance to have $15,000 a month. If I want to make $15,000 a month and I want to work five days a week, that's going to average out to be about $3,000 per day. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I was going to mow this many yards, how many yards could I mow per day? If I could have two guys in a truck and they could mow 30 yards in a day, then for each yard, I need to be charging $100 a month. And I think it's good to have a standard like that. And then, you know, over time, you can just basically, instead of really thinking about it per yard, you can just increase that amount you want per month per route. And then it kind of just trickles down and it makes it easy and makes it, you know, super simplistic. Yeah, I like anytime you're developing your pricing structure, not on like 
vague notions of what the market will support, but on what you're doing there, we're like, this route needs to bring in this much per month to meet the goals of the business. And let's work backwards from there into a price. That's a really cool strategy. Yeah, that's how, that's how I kind of started to break it down over time. And that's kind of how I'm, you know, going forward right now. Yeah. Oh man, I had a thought about pricing low in the beginning. Oh, it's that you want to have a reason to be competing on price. And so you're right about like, when you start right out the gate, you have to overcome the like trust objection where you're brand new. They've never heard of you before. They've never seen your, your truck in their neighborhood, you know, that kind of thing. You can, you can get a little bit of goodwill by competing on price and overcome their objections of I've never like heard of this person before or this company before by just being a little more competitive on price than your competitors. And you can get people that way. But once you have, you know, enough Google reviews that people can see when they look you up, you have a presence, they've seen you in their neighborhood, you know, you kind of have early adopters that you might give a deal to. And then from there, once you have the social proof and you have just the visibility, there's not really a reason to compete on price anymore because I don't think you're going to make it up in volume. I know that that's the lie that every entrepreneur tells themselves is like, I'm going to become McDonald's and I can sell a 99 cent hamburger because I'm going to sell 6 million hamburgers. But a lot of times you do not have the, you know, all of the bean counters that McDonald's has and the buying power to make their meat, you know, super cheap and all of that. So you end up where you're losing money on each job or just barely profitable. And it's really, really hard to make it up in volume, especially if you lo- you can't make it up in volume if you're losing money on every... We do have a recent episode about pricing higher, demanding premium prices, and just kind of how to position yourself in the market to be able to price high. Do you have any like quick thoughts on, on what someone needs to do if they're trying to transition out of like kind of being the value option in their market to becoming a more premium option? Yeah, so I I actually did do this. You know, when I first started, I started out with, you know, more value pricing. And then I said, okay, I want to become more of a, because I honestly think it's it's easier, even if you are trying to become the McDonald's, it's easier to scale as a boutique and then bring the value pricing after. I think Mm -hmm. it's easier to work back than it is to work through being value option. Because yeah. then it's hard to have capital. But when I first started and I wanted to increase my price, what I would do is just basically do extra things that the customer wouldn't, you know, really expect of you, but just help out. Like in the beginning, I made sure if their trash can was out, I put it, you know, to the front door or to the garage. And then I made sure because in the neighborhoods that, you know, I was mowing in. They threw the newsletters and I made sure I brought that to the front door. So just doing like those extra touches, making sure I clean out the sprinkler heads, just making sure we, you know, pay attention to detail and just do a couple extra genuine things just to help their day out. Yeah. Yeah. That like 110% customer service. And it's super, super valuable, especially when you're starting out, because that's how you're going to get your first five-star Google reviews. That's how you're going to get them to refer a neighbor to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's really solid. And then our our final mistake here is not spending enough on marketing that a lot of times guys will have, I've been talking about this all, all month, I feel like a broken record. People will have really audacious growth goals. And then you look on their budget for how much they're allocating for marketing. And a lot of times it is a zero or it is you know exactly the same amount they spent last year, but they want to grow 30% more than they did last year. And it's like, how do you expect, did you get 30% better at marketing in in the last year? And maybe you did, maybe that's, you're feeling really confident because of that. But uh, do you have thoughts on like why people are afraid to spend on their marketing? Yeah, I I just feel like a lot of people are scared because they don't, you know, they haven't found a way that can 100% confirm a return on investment. I feel like once you figure out a way that, you know, returns, for me, how I looked at it is the way I was able to scale super quickly was through Google ads. I just, you mm-hmm. know, got, I understood how Google ads work pretty easily. And then I just went forward with that. And when it came to, when it comes to me, I just looked at it. You just need to start testing and figuring out something that gives you a return on your money. So say whether it's passing out door hangers, whether it's Google ads, Facebook ads, if you can find out a return on investment, if you, if you really think about it, there makes no sense why not to 
increase your budget because yeah. you're just going to make more money. It's like you you found it in real life money glitch. That's what I like to say. Yes. And I, yeah. I, pre I, I preach marketing all the time. And I feel like the if you figure out a way that returns money and that can return, you know, at a, a maybe 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x. I mean, you found it in real life money glitch. And I would, uh, mm. you know, use that as much as possible till yeah, until the return starts to dry. Yeah. The way I usually talk about it, because I'm like one tick older than you is like, if you found a machine that when you put a quarter in it, it spit out two quarters or three quarters, you would be there all day because why, why not? You're, you're tripling your money all day long. Yeah. I mean, you really, you have to figure out your, your marketing strategy that works for your business. And a lot of times, especially on the road to 100K, you may not have money to, to outsource it. You you probably don't want to go with you know the, the absolute cheapest outsourcing option because you're going to end up with maybe worse ads than you could produce yourself. The big thing that I would do, like especially if you're nervous about ROI, is to go with things that are a little more time intensive and a little less cash intensive. So put your time into you know printing some flyers and going to the houses surrounding your best clients, right? That's going to reward density. It's going to get you clients who are used to seeing you already. And so you've got like visibility, you've got some trust that they see the neighbor's lawn looks good. And then it benefits the, the business with the, the route density. So that's where I would kind of get started, especially if you're, you're feeling stuck, you need to get out. Like number one is going to be, you're going to have to put in something to marketing. You can't, it's going to be really hard to scale past 100k relying on like word of mouth and and free or freemium kind of marketing options but you're going to eventually want to spend money to scale because exactly like you said you want something that's repeatable that you know hey if i spend this much money on this marketing channel i can expect you know client acquisition is x I can expect this many for that many dollars. So you really, you just have to get out there and you have to, you have to spend money to make money and no one wants to hear that. Right. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. And I, and actually about that, I actually, when I did first start, that's how I started to do door hangers. I passed out, but I didn't pass out a small amount. I went straight home run. I was home run. I passed out 10,000 in the first two months. Yeah. I was out every like single day. Passing out yeah. On foot. Oh my gosh, dude. That's incredible. Yeah, I actually, I, I, I got an overuse injury. I was walking so much. I was walking like 15 miles a day. Oh my and, gosh. But it, it, at the end of the day, it was worth it. And what I kind of came to realize is on like door hangers were the best marketing when it comes to price per lead. Yeah. But then when it, once you do start generating income, then it is easier to go with a way like I don't actively run Google ads. I run them, you know, automated with their algorithms. So mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about my marketing anymore. So basically now I don't have to, like when it comes to, okay, I put $2 in, I get $10 out. I don't have to actively put $2 in, you know what I mean? Yeah. Rather than pass out the door hanger. So I 100% agree with starting on foot with door hangers because that's how I started and it worked out for me. Yeah. Well, and it's good to hear from someone who's built a substantial business in the last few years that door hangers still work because a lot of times, you know, you hear from guys who did a similar strategy, but it's, you know, they started their business 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So it's really cool that the door hangers are, are still working. Have you done any like every door direct mail or anything like that? Actually, I have not tried it yet. Okay. I do. I still, to this day, run door hanger routes. We're going to have a door hanger. I call them door hanger marches. And we're going to have a door hanger march coming in the second two weeks of February. And I get, have a couple kids from the local high school and they, you know, go out and pass out all the door hangers. Even when you have other people run them for you, technically speaking, it still is a better return on investment than anything I've ever been able to get so far. Mm -hmm. Door hangers have been the best return so far. Yeah. And when you're, when you're specifically distributing them, along an existing route then it like it just makes every job on that route more profitable so it's it's perfect yeah yeah man well chase thanks so much for for coming on the show man i appreciate it yeah no problem yeah where can people find you online if they're looking for you so i have instagram for lawn care specifically and it is grow landscaping services 
Okay. And on there, you know, people DM me all the time asking for advice because I do have a YouTube channel and it kind of trickled in from my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of people ask for advice. I do coaching calls. I do, you know, anything to help people out just so people can learn and get specific information because I feel like there was a lot of information out there that's just general. It wasn't specific. And I kind of just had to go out there and figure out a lot of things on my own, even though there was a lot of, you know, YouTubers and stuff. So yeah. I, I try to get the specific information, what matters and what I think matters most is marketing. Yeah. Well, yeah. we'll have a link in the show notes where you can find Chase on Instagram and YouTube. But again, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.